Clubs are happy to boast one champion full forward in their history. Collingwood has had stacks. Would you believe that a magpie topped the goal kicking ladder 22 times during the first 43 years of the league? Dickie Lee was probably the greatest of them all. He was football's most celebrated high flyer in his day. That is from 1906 to 1922. Just look at all the medals and trophies he won. In fact, the cheer up there, Kazali only came about when Lee was near retirement. After Lee came the fabulous Gordon Coventry. Old nuts, as he was affectionately called. Was the Don Bradman of football. And how about this? He played in a record 31 final matches and kicked a remarkable 1,299 goals between 1920 and 1937. No player will ever top that total, I reckon. One day in 1929, Gordon Coventry kicked 16 goals. The next season he went one better, kicking 17 goals in a game. A famous Collingwood supporter and patron, John Wren, rewarded Nuts with 50 quid each time, and that was a lot of money in those days. Well, there's no doubt about it, John Wren loved goal kickers. I can recall playing out at North Melbourne, that's on their home ground at Arden Street, and I'd kick seven goals this day. As a matter of fact, I had a bad day. Went into the dressing room and John Wren was standing there with uh, Jock McCarley, who was our coach. And I walked past him to go to the shower. I didn't do anything about it. So I finished up having 16 showers. And on the 16th shower, I was walking past, back uh, past John Wren. And uh, he finally shook hands with me. I felt something crispy going to my hand. And when I got back to my locker, which is actually a nail on the wall at North Melbourne, I found I was well rewarded. In modern times, Peter McKenna has been Collingwood's outstanding full forward. There's no doubt about that. I'll tell you what Collingwood means to me. 11 years of tremendous excitement, great loyalty of the supporters, tremendous players I've played with. Who could forget the Richardson brothers, Barry Price in the centre, great ruckman Len Thompson, and of course the great courage of Des Tuddenham and Ted Potter playing at centre half back. Also the coaches I've played under, Neil Mann, and of course the great Bobby Rose himself. Of course, people talk about tradition. Modern people say, forget about tradition. I say baloney to that. I think tradition is most important, particularly in this great club, the greatest club of all. There's a bit of an argument about it, about where our club was actually formed. But one thing's certain, after the Collingwood Football Club deposed the Britannias in 1892, its first committee meetings were held here, at the Grace Darling Hotel, because we didn't have a grandstand yet at Victoria Park. Our first year in the VFA didn't exactly set the football world on fire. In fact, we ended the season at the bottom of the ladder, which didn't happen again until 1976. But at least we were off and running. The team gradually improved once the club started paying the players, and by our fifth season, Collingwood won a premiership. A year later, we helped form the VFL. And believe you me, they couldn't have done it without us. Really, the league has always needed Collingwood, because every football follower either loves them or they hate them. So blow out and win calling words. There's no team we'd rather see winning. 
And there's no team that likes winning more. Well, I'll tell you something about the stab kick. I don't know whether you know it or not, but Collingwood invented it. It revolutionised football right back in 1902. Changed the whole pattern of the game. It enabled the Magpies to win back-to-back -back flags in 1902 and 3. And the man who thought of it, one of our finest players ever, was Dick Condon. Condon had been disqualified for life by the league in 1900. But fortunately for Collingwood, he got a reprieve after 18 months. Condon's close mate, Charlie Panham Sr., my grandfather, helped him develop the stab pass. Charlie's son, Alby, who was the most elusive player I've ever seen, can tell us about it. We used to find in our day that it was a great value. And for those information about it is that uh, when you do a stab pass, is when you're at a fairly good pace and you're coming down the ground and you see your fellow comrade, you give it with a slap bang pass and which alternated into a, a drop punt after that. In the first 25 years of the league, Collingwood won five flags, finished up runner-up seven times and only missed out on the finals once. But Collingwood's run was just beginning, as recalled by Bruce Andrew. They were champions in their own right, but not one of them thought he was better than anybody else because he was just a cog in the magpie machine. And that was the spirit of Collingwood then. They were a united group. In fact, as I recall and I, I look around this ground and I see the Sharon stand and remember that our old grandstand was about uh, one-fifth the size of the current Sharon stand and uh, in our, our dressing room, we call it the dressing room or training room, uh, we had one, sh one bath, we had one shower. And, uh, you know, come off the ground, covered with mud, and there'd be three of us could fit into this uh, bath. One would sit each end, the other fellow would stand up in the middle. And believe me, that was the, the closeness that made uh, that Collingwood side the great uh, machine. I'm referring to that because we did believe in it. The spirit was fantastic. Everybody worked together, and they were mates. The Collingwood spirit was personified by Harry Collier. He and his brother Albert, better known as leader, each played in six Collingwood premierships. And if you wanted Harry to win a Collingwood Guernsey, he didn't need pepper and salt. They talk about eating a Collingwood Guernsey. I think in our times the kids would all eat a Guernsey just to be a black and white player. Well, to beat Collingwood, I was born on that side of the ground, went to school this part, and there's the ground in the middle. Who wouldn't want to play with Collingwood? Who wouldn't want to be black and white? Well, that's the way we were. Most of the kids at the uh, school here, when we left the school ground, we'd be over at the training. And that was one of the parts of the things, I think, that helped to make my brother and myself Collingwood footballers. Another reason for Collingwood's success was leadership. Sid Coventry was one of the club's greatest leaders. He holds the unique distinction of captaining Collingwood to four flags in a row. Our oldest player from that era, Jiggy Harris, recalls the importance of Coventry. But I give Coventry the top marks for the way he led the side and also the love of club that he instilled into the players. After Coventry captain Collingwood for eight years, Harry Collier took over for the next five. The Magpies made the grand final all five times and won two flags. In 1935 and six were two of our great years. As in, it's in these two games, we knocked South off in each of them. They were the favourites really in the games. But the 35 one, that was the year that Bob Pratt alighted off a track.